So how do you differentiate drama from trauma on the internet? You don't. Because unless you are the person experiencing the adversity or you are the doctor or psychologist that is working directly with that person to help them get a proper diagnosis, that is not up to you to decide. Hello everyone, this is Kalimar here and no, it's not Calamari. I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video because I'm fairly certain that the subject matter is going to get this video demonetized and that's fine. Because when it comes to videos on mental health and mental illnesses, I want to be able to share my perspectives as someone with clinical knowledge and professional experience dealing with those conditions and sharing educational resources that the average person without university access or knowledge of such resources would not have access to. Recently, there's been a video going around the art commentary community made by Omnia that really did not sit well with many people, particularly on how it attempted to define trauma. If you guys have followed me since my earlier content, you would know that I dabbled a bit in drama videos, but I discovered that I don't enjoy drama commentary very much, so I've stopped doing them. However, I'm also very passionate about mental health, and if there is one thing I can't stand, it's misinformation about mental health. Now, Omnia did not actually spread any misinformation in their video. The tool they referenced, the DSM-5, does define trauma with the criteria they mentioned in their video. But the thing is, the DSM-5's definition of trauma is also widely criticized for being exclusionary of experiences of trauma that isn't PTSD. And the article they used for their evidence is about proposing a better model to define trauma because of how exclusionary the DSM-5 criterion A is. So the article they used to back up their claims of the validity of DSM-5 for diagnosing trauma versus regular drama is in fact criticizing the DSM-5 because it is so exclusionary of the actual experience of trauma. I've yet to see anyone discussing this component of their video because if Omnia had just read the article through, I think they could have been able to share a much more meaningful insight into trauma. However, I do also want to note that there were a few comments on Omnia's video that brought up the fact that the article they used is heavily criticized in the scientific community, but I personally couldn't find any sources on this. I even went and checked on Loop and Scopus, which are two well-known and reputable resources for checking if an article is considered high quality evidence, including whether or not it was peer-reviewed, which journal published it, and if that journal is a reputable journal or one of those journals you can just buy in to publish, and how many articles since its publishing have actually cited it as evidence. And from what I've seen, this article hasn't really gone around a lot, so it hasn't really made that big an impact in the scientific community, specifically in the field of psychology. So it's kind of fallen under the radar based off of my interpretations of their numbers on Scopus and Loop. And from the articles that have cited this article, I couldn't find any critical analyses of the proposed model that we're going to be looking at today. So if anyone does have links or access to these critical analyses of Krupnik's traumatic stress continuum model, please let me know in the comments because I'd be really interested in reading it. Before we go any further into the video, I want to briefly talk about a regular sponsor here on the channel, Squarespace. Squarespace is the best all-in-one platform for all your artistic needs. Whether you need to make a professional-looking commission page, an online portfolio, or just somewhere to dump your original story ideas and OCs like your phone's notes app, but nicer and more organized, Squarespace is the perfect place to do that. Because that's exactly what I'm using my Squarespace website for. They have dozens of pre-made templates that make your website look super professional and you don't even need a lick of coding knowledge. So head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Kalimara or use code Kalimara to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I personally think the article presents some interesting perspectives, but only from a theoretical standpoint because I'm not really sure what the implications are for its implementation into clinical practice. Like, does it imply we will need to change the treatment algorithms we use for non-PTSD forms of trauma? I don't know. 
I think there's a lot of things to be studied from this proposed model, and it definitely has a long way to go before it actually does have any impact on how we treat trauma in clinical practice. I am still sticking with my policy of no drama, so although this video does kind of discuss the difference between drama and trauma, this is not a response to Omnia. I'm not going to go through the points they made in their videos and argue with them. Plus, at the time of me writing the script, they've literally just posted an apology video, which yes, I have watched, and no, I'm not going to talk about whether it's good or not because that's up to the person watching. And whilst I have my own opinions, I do not think it necessary to share them in this video. Because this video is not a drama video. This video is simply an informational video and literature review on the scholarly literature about trauma because it does bring up some interesting perspectives on how we are currently defining and categorizing trauma that I think might warrant discussion. My goal really is just to educate the viewers on why I think Omnia's push for people on the internet to decide whether a situation is drama or trauma is fundamentally harmful and that I wish their message had focused on being more respectful to people's predicaments online. Because at the end of the day, None of us are qualified or have the right to make the distinction on what is and isn't trauma, because not even researchers have agreed on a specific definition of trauma yet. Every individual responds to different things in different ways. That's why there are so many recognized phobias. As onlookers, we aren't qualified to draw that line and put people in categories. Most of the time, we're only glancing into a person's life for a brief window of time and we lack far too much information, training, and education to be able to confidently say whether or not an adverse experience is traumatic to someone. When diagnosing mental disorders, doctors and psychologists don't just use one type of test. They will often use a variety of specialized tests for specific mental disorders to either get a diagnosis or determine the specific type of disorder within a cluster of disorders to optimize treatment. And if it takes multiple tests, trial and error, and direct evaluation of the individual for trained professionals who have studied medicine and psychology for years to confirm a diagnosis, then clearly the average person isn't going to come anywhere near an accurate or productive conclusion with one test they've probably never been taught to interpret the results of and evaluate a person they've never met. Furthermore, I worry it might lead people to conflate trauma with PTSD, which is even more detrimental because then we would be spreading actual misinformation. Because one is an experience and the other is a mental health disorder derived from the experience of trauma. And just because a person does not develop PTSD from their trauma does not mean they did not experience trauma. It also compels one to pose the question of why? Why is there a need for the average onlooker to be diagnosing whether a certain situation is dramatic or traumatic? What are the desired outcomes of this? Is it an attempt to identify which topics or experiences are off the table and which are fair game for criticism and mockery? Or on a more positive outlook, perhaps it's to promote more critical thinking and situational awareness in the audience. But if it is truly the latter, I would argue that a bit of common sense should suffice, right? In Omnia's video, they use an article titled Trauma or Drama, a Predictive Processing Perspective on the Continuum of Stress. Now, this article is very exciting and interesting to me because it tries to recontextualize how trauma is defined, how it can be categorized, and what clinical implications that might have. So, when Omnia brought it up in their video, I was immediately compelled to look more into it because it did make their points seem more evidence-based. But then, I read the article, compared it to their points, and I quickly realized that Omnia had severely misinterpreted, or at least took bits of the article out of context to suit their narrative. So they kind of did it a bit dirty. Because whilst Omnia isn't incorrect in their chosen definition of trauma, the article they chose unfortunately just goes against their own thesis statement for their video. Given my background and expertise, I think I'm qualified enough to elaborate and educate you guys on what this article is actually about. In case you guys aren't aware, I am a registered nurse. I just got my Bachelor of Nursing last year and I am currently in the process of applying to medical school. So while I'm not as qualified as a psychiatrist or a psychologist would be to talk about trauma, 
I did complete a course in mental health and attended clinical placement at a mental health facility and dealt with patients that had mental health backgrounds in other settings throughout my placement career. But the most relevant experience I have is actually reading, evaluating, and interpreting medical scholarly literature, which I would say I'm pretty good at. I was on a research scholarship that allowed me to participate in an actual ongoing research project. I worked as a research assistant for a separate research project, and I got a high distinction for my research course, which for you non-Australians watching is the highest grade you could get in university in Australia. Am I exposing myself for being a huge nerd in university? Yes, but now I can finally be cool with that background. So let me teach you how to read these kinds of articles. The first and most important thing you want to read is the abstract, which summarizes the entire article in one paragraph. And already it tells us that many researchers find the definition of trauma outlined in the DSM-5 to be too constraining and does not account for the complexity and many aspects of trauma. Omnia does bring this up in their second video, but it doesn't seem to change their conclusions. Now let's move on to the introduction of the article, which was highlighted quite a bit in Omnia's video. Introductions are where the author will provide context on the topic or propose an issue to be addressed. The introduction is also where you would find the thesis statement of the article, which is the stated aim or purpose of this research paper. Unfortunately, Omnia failed to capture this in their video. They only used a small tidbit of it that conveyed only half of the point the author was making and leaves out quite a bit of explanations that I think could be beneficial for you guys to know. So I will be discussing them here. The article states that there are two trends in defining trauma. Omnia did a great job highlighting the first trend, which is criterion A for acute and post-traumatic stress disorders in the DSM-5. This definition attempts to establish clear boundaries on what is and isn't considered trauma, and it also warns against a conceptual bracket creep that risks trivializing trauma by eroding its singularity. And it does require an experience to be extremely severe in order for the person to be identified as having trauma. This trend emphasizes the importance of creating a distinction between trauma and adversity. In this context, we can say that adversity is equivalent to trauma because they are often conflated with trauma despite having different outcomes and lumping them together under the category of trauma is misleading, according to this definition. This narrow definition has done wonders to progress the treatment and understanding of PTSD. However, the PTSD diagnostic criteria, as the name suggests, is only effective for the diagnosis and treatment of PTSD and excludes developmental trauma, type 1 and type 2 trauma, which are singular traumatic events and cumulative trauma from repeated abuse, respectively. Which brings us to the second trend a more inclusive, dimensional view on trauma which completely erases the boundary between trauma and adversity and places PTSD as its extreme manifestation. According to the article, this view is especially prevalent in the clinical realm or the aspect of healthcare concerned with diagnosis and treatment as opposed to research and development. And it proposes the notion that trauma is a continuum from small trauma to big trauma. This is where my first big takeaway of the article appears. There is more to trauma than PTSD. And now we get the thesis statement of the article, which is to explore a hybrid model of trauma proposed by the author that utilizes both the categorical and dimensional view of trauma. This model is what the article is about to try and reconcile the disparity between the dimensional and categorical views of trauma in order to be more inclusive of different types of trauma, yet maintain clear distinctions to avoid the trivialization of it. And it's such a shame that Omnia didn't just make this the main focus of their video, because it would have given them much better nuance on the topic with the potential to educate people better on trauma and perhaps guide them to seek help for their own trauma that they perhaps didn't realize they have because it doesn't quite fall in line with PTSD, which is why I'm doing this video. 
Now, after the introduction, normally you'd just skip straight to the results and conclusions. But if you like to do a bit of extra like I do, you actually read some of the discussions and some of the references used by the article. So naturally, I also went and accessed the author's 2019 article titled Trauma or Adversity, which was heavily referenced in this article. I do find it interesting that they chose to use the term adversity for their original article and then drama for their second one, because the term drama never actually comes up in the article, which I find a bit misleading. Let me know your theories as to why the author chose to do this. But when you are conducting research and you are looking for references, you should always strive to use primary sources because secondary sources will often be someone else's interpretation and it's better to form your own opinion of it. It's a bit more acceptable here because it's the same author interpreting their own work, but I still wanted to see what findings they had in their original article. I will say that not everyone will be able to access this article because it is locked behind a paywall. I think it's about $15, but luckily I was able to access it for free because I still have an active university email because I'm still working there as a tutor. And I'm really glad that I was able to access that article because it really contextualizes what this current article is about and it includes information that this article that was used by Omnia doesn't elaborate on again. If you are curious about it, I have the downloaded article linked in my description, but to summarize, the author, Valerie Krupnik, suggests that trauma is a stress response regardless of the stressor's nature. The hybrid model they are proposing defines trauma as a particular kind of stress response, a traumatic stress response, where its properties differentiate it from a normal stress response and from responses to adversity which is also called a pathogenic stress response. So these are the terms that they are defining in their article. So keep that in mind because we're gonna be using them a lot. If this is twisting your brain a bit, they're basically saying that some people may experience trauma as a response to stress, but it is not the only response to stress that exists. Another stress response they discussed in the original article used in Omnia's video is depression. Trauma is not an event, but the subjective experience of stress, according to this article. How this model conceptualizes trauma is through the stress continuum, which is measured along two axes, the severity of stressors and strength of self-regulatory functions. This is what the model looks like. As you can see, the continuum is divided into three categories, normative stress response, pathogenic stress response, and finally, traumatic stress response. In normative stress response, the individual is able to adapt to the stressors by returning to the optimal functional state and no illness ensues. But when they can't, the body undergoes allostasis, which means the body will change its set points to a suboptimal level to maintain stability under pressure from stressors. So for a bit of background information here, the body always likes to maintain a state of balance, so it has certain points that it will try to maintain in order to keep that balance. For example, we like to keep our body temperature at a certain range, and if we drop below that range or go above it, that's when issues start arising. When allostasis occurs, what's happening is the body is actually changing those set points because the body isn't able to maintain the set points it had before so it has to compensate and because it's compensating it's not really functioning the way it should be but it's functional enough but eventually that can lead to a condition called allostatic overload which is when the body reaches its limit of operating on a suboptimal level and gets sick there are two ways allostatic overload can progress. They can progress, according to this article, to either type 2, which is a gradual drift away from the body's initial state of balance without triggering an emergency response, and self-regulatory functions remain relatively intact. Or they can go to type 1, where a stressor overload triggers an emergency response and causes a breakdown of self-regulatory functions. 
Basically, self-regulatory functions are things you do to understand and manage your behavior and your reactions to feelings and things happening around you, be it consciously or subconsciously. It's kind of a fancy way of saying how well you can cope with stress. And obviously, it varies from person to person based on their personalities, their backgrounds, their life experiences, etc. And getting back to Krupnik's model for a second, remember how the stress continuum is measured along two axes? Well, Omnia touched on only one of them in their video, which is the severity of the stressor. But what is equally important is the person's strength of self-regulatory functions, or as we've gone through before, how well they can cope and bounce back from the stressors they experience, regardless of severity. The article itself states that any stressor can potentially trigger a traumatic response, as long as its severity overwhelms the individual's ability to self-regulate. So the notion that extremely severe stressors like physical violence, sexual abuse, or threatened death are the only types of stressors that could cause a traumatic stress response is simply outdated and inapplicable to real-life practices. According to the model, people with robust self-regulation can withstand high-severity stressors, including criterion A ones, without being traumatized whereas those with either compromised or underdeveloped self-regulation, for example, children, can be especially vulnerable to traumatization. Therefore, the range of what is considered trauma is entirely subjective and can look vastly different from individual to individual. Because of that, we, the people on the internet that make silly little videos, shouldn't be trying to create hard and fast rules to decide and categorize this, because we're all unqualified dummies with a YouTube addiction. I sure am, at least. But if you want a clear distinction for what is and isn't trauma, at least according to this article, then you should focus on the individual's response to a stressor. The article states, to be considered traumatic, a stress response to an event must meet a necessary condition that the event be outside of the person's normative life experience and a sufficient condition that the response include a breakdown of self-regulatory functions. So, using the stress continuum model, an experience can be considered a trauma if it causes a traumatic stress response and quote-unquote drama if it is a pathogenic stress response which is the less severe condition on this model. However, it is still important to note that just because pathogenic stress is not considered trauma, it can still result in illness and different types of stress responses, such as anxiety or depression, which are just as serious. To give you an example, imagine you are renting your very first apartment. You're not making enough money from your part-time work and you've missed several months of rent payments, so now you're being evicted. Someone could have financial support from their family to find better living arrangements without needing to worry about potentially being homeless. And they've been meaning to move out anyway because they don't like the apartment. So the stress of eviction doesn't bother them as much and they're able to come out of the experience unaffected mentally, emotionally, and physically. Meanwhile, another person could develop anxiety and depression from the stress of losing their home and being forced to find a new place to stay because maybe they don't have that financial support from their family and maybe they don't have the means to just quickly pack up and move. But they'd still be able to pack their belongings, find a new living arrangement, and plan for a move. They wouldn't feel like themselves from the stress of suddenly losing their home, and it would take a while for them to feel like themselves again after, but they're still functional. If someone reacts this way, it is a pathogenic stress response. It is adversity. However, other people might find this experience completely debilitating. They've never experienced eviction before and have no idea how to cope with their current situation, so they end up breaking down. They're unable to make sure that they would still have a roof over their heads, they can't control their thoughts and emotions, 
No matter what they try, they can't seem to calm themselves down or ease their stress, even though the strategies or activities they're trying helped them cope before. They just have no idea what to do. This is a traumatic stress response. This is trauma, at least according to the stress continuum model. So while the article distinguishes that not all stress-induced pathology is trauma, it's completely possible for non-traumatic experiences to lead to trauma, depending on the severity of stressors, the duration of allostatic overload, and the person's ability to cope and self-regulate. What can be considered traumatic for one person may not be considered traumatic for another, but just because one person may not experience trauma from that stressor does not mean the other person is lying about being traumatized or that their experience is any less traumatic to them. Basically, to sum up how this article defines the difference between trauma and drama slash adversity, not every stressful or distressing event in your life can be considered trauma, but trauma can come from anything. Of course, this is just how this article attempts to conceptualize and define trauma. If you prefer the all-inclusive, dimensional approach that views all stress-induced pathology as trauma, then you're completely free to go with it. Or if you prefer the narrow and rigid definition of the DSM-5 criterion A, you're free to use that too. At least until the DSM-6 comes out. Let me know what you think of this article in the comments below. Do you agree with it? Do you think it did a good job at conceptualizing the experience of trauma? Do you agree with how it differentiates between trauma and drama? I look forward to hearing what you think. I really didn't expect to enjoy diving into this article as much as I did. For some reason, it's incredibly nostalgic, even though I distinctly remember being sick of looking at them when I was in university. So yeah, let me know if you find any interesting articles you want me to analyze. But I think the main takeaway of this video is just be respectful to everyone on the internet. Just because you can't see them face to face and they can't see you face to face doesn't mean that there's not an actual person behind the screen. And you never know what someone might be going through in their lives. And it's not your place to judge unless they're actively doing something illegal and hurting a lot of people, then I think we have a right to criticize that person for their actions. But yeah, shout out to my lovely pond dwellers for supporting me. If you want to see more from me, then please follow me on all my social media. If you want to chat with me, join my Discord server. And if you want to see more of my stories, check out my comic because that will make me really happy. And I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!